Let us begin our scripture readings this morning, of which there are a few, uh, with Matthew 26, verses 1 through 5, 14 through 16, 20 through 28. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the courtyard of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for opportunities to betray him. When it was evening, he took his place with the 12 disciples while they were eating. He said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. John 13, 21 through 30. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one who Jesus loved, was reclining close to his heart. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. No one knew why he said this to him, 
Some thought that because Jesus, because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. John 18, 1 through 8. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you were looking for me, let these people go. Matthew 27, 1 through 10. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Acts 1, 15 through 20. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language, Hakaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his house become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position 
of overseer. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol, for reading all of those scriptures. And thank you, Calvary, for listening and bearing witness to as much of Judas's story as we know. Perhaps more than any other disciple, I felt it important to hear as much about his life as we could. A content warning as I begin today, as you have already heard in our scripture readings, my sermon today includes discussion about suicide. So if this is a tender or sensitive subject for you, please do what you need to do to care for yourself. That may mean leaving the sanctuary, turning off the live stream, know that You are not alone in your journey. And if you yourself are experiencing thoughts of suicide, know that you can talk to me, another pastor, another Calvaryite, a family member, a friend, a mental health professional. You can call the National Suicide and Crisis Hotline, 988. We want you to know that you're not alone in having those thoughts and you're not alone in having to try to figure out what to do with them. Your life matters. And with that, we turn to our disciple for today, Judas Iscariot, whose life holds great meaning for us, I believe, even if it's his death that usually gets most of the attention. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve, one of the first who were called by Jesus as his disciples. Nobody really knows what the word Iscariot means. Scholars debate about it. Most believe that it indicates the town Judas was from, Kerioth. And if this is true, that means that Judas Iscariot is the only disciple from Judea. All the others were from the Galilee area. Iscariot was most likely used as a descriptor for Judas because there were a lot of other Judases in the Bible. It was a very common name. There are at least three mentioned in the Gospels. Two are disciples. One is Jesus' half-brother. And altogether, there are eight different Judases in the New Testament. But it is not Iscariot that forever defines this Judas for us, is it? Judas is who we know and who all people for all time know as the betrayer. There was never meant to be any question for us about who Judas was or rather what he did. The gospel writers spared no suspense for us about Judas Iscariot. Right off the bat, In their Gospels, they tell us who he is. Matthew says he's the one who betrayed Jesus. Luke says he's the one who became a traitor. Mark says he's the one who handed Jesus over. Judas Iscariot is always listed last in the line of the disciples, as if to say, oh yeah, and then there is that guy. Before we, the reader, even get a chance to know Judas or anything else about him, we are told of his betrayal. In contrast, think about the other disciples. Think about Thomas. We know he had doubts, but he's not listed at the beginning as the doubter. Peter denies Jesus three times, but he's not listed at the beginning as the denier. James and John, those guys are full of ego. They want to sit on the right and left hand side of Jesus in heaven, but they're not called the selfish ones or the self-important ones. Other disciples make mistakes. Other disciples hurt Jesus. Yet only Judas Iscariot is condemned to forever be known by his one action 
of betrayal. Only Judas never had a chance to be known for anything else that he most assuredly was, right? A faithful follower of Jesus, one who said yes when Jesus called, giving up his profession and his family, one who witnessed miracles and was sent two by two into villages to share the gospel, one who sat through all those teachings on the Sermon of the Mount, one who helped on the boat that was tossing and turning out at sea, one who was given the responsibility of treasurer, of keeping the common purse for the disciples. Surely that indicates a significant level of competency and trust. But instead of remembering all of these things, Judas Iscariot has become for us our scapegoat. The one who takes the biggest blame for being a disciple who hurts Jesus in the biggest way possible, who does the wrong of all wrongs, whose sin is so egregious he must be replaced by another. Judas Iscariot becomes the one to whom we can all point to and say, well, I may have messed up big time, but at least I'm not like Judas. I'm not like Judas. <laughs> he betrayed Jesus, sold him out for a few pieces of silver. I would never do that. Well, Calvary, if I'm honest, I can think back over my life, and there are a lot of times that I choose my own comfort, my own desires, my own selfishness over the call of Christ. There are many times where I have betrayed my relationship with Jesus, not just after knowing him three years, but knowing him over three plus decades. There are times when I have chosen to stay silent on an airplane when somebody asks me about Jesus or my faith and I just want to sleep. There are times when I have stayed silent when others have defined Jesus as someone for their own profit or politics or gain and I have not stood up and said, no, that's not who Jesus is. It's a curious thing how we curse and condemn Judas, and yet, I don't know about you, but I can see myself pretty clearly in him at times. The thing about Judas is, even when he knows that Jesus knows that he's going to betray him, you know, Jesus says, go and do what you're going to do quickly, Judas still goes and does it, doesn't he? It's like being caught with your hand in the cookie jar, right? And instead of just discreetly pulling your, your hand out of the cookie jar, backpedaling, saying, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't going to eat a cookie. I was just checking to see, you know, if there were still some in there, if they were fresh or whatever. No. Judas' hand is in the cookie jar. He gets caught, and he proceeds to take out the cookie and eat it anyway. He is caught before he does the thing and yet he does the thing anyway. This is Judas. He's so utterly human, which makes him so utterly like us. <laughs> Judas caved at this opportunity to make some quick cash. He hears that the chief priests and elders don't want to arrest Jesus in the public because it'll create a riot. And he knows where Jesus likes to hang out at night and pray. He knows how to get Jesus by himself. And he says, how much will you give me if I just show you where Jesus is? They say 30 pieces of silver, and Judas just decides it's, it's worth the relationship, right? It's worth the risk. And he betrays Jesus with a kiss. This whole scene may seem like a character out of The Godfather or some other mob movie, but as we've seen this week, an indictment after indictment of so many of our government leaders for conspiracy and racketeering, you can be one of the most important people in the world and still feel that you need to protect and prove your position and your power and your worth through behind the scenes means. No matter the cost, no matter the laws broken, no matter the damage done, no matter the integrity lost, 
I mean, Judas is not the only one who looks for an opportunity to serve himself instead of serving others, is he? And then there's his death. Judas dies by suicide. And this is where we perhaps see ourselves most clearly in him and most tenderly and most tragically. Because most, if not all of us, know somebody who has died by suicide and or we ourselves have had thoughts of suicide or maybe even attempted it. To question one's worth, to wonder whether life is worth living is a very human thing. Just as Judas's suicide is pushed under the rug, we don't talk about it much in church, so too are the suicides of our loved ones and the suicidal thoughts that we might harbor. The stigma and shame of suicide keeps us silent about it, which is tragic because the resounding echoes of its effect reverberate so loudly through the lives of all the loved ones who remain. As tragic as his death is, have you ever thought about how poignant it is that one of Jesus' disciples died by suicide? It shows us that we need not be silent about it. Suicide says nothing about one's faithfulness as a follower. It merely reveals how alone and desperate one felt in a singular moment in their life. You see, Je Judas, when he actually sees Jesus being bound and condemned, what does he do? Did you know this part of the story? <laughs> he tries to return the silver. He goes back to the chief priests and the elders and he repents. He's conflicted on the inside. He is disturbed and, and who knows what he thought when he betrayed Jesus originally. Maybe he thought that it wouldn't mean much, right? Jesus can save himself. He's seen Jesus raise people from the dead and perform miracles. On the other hand, Jesus has been telling the disciples time and time again that he's going to die, you know, be crucified, that he's going to raise again on the third day. So maybe Judas thought, it's all inevitable anyway. Why don't I just speed up this process? We don't know why Judas did what he did, but when he saw the effects of what was happening to Jesus, he broke down. He was remorseful. He repented. I tend to think that he must have felt like the weight of what was happening to Jesus was on his shoulders. He felt some depth of heaviness that he, he thought could not be reversed because we're told that he leaves this encounter with the chief priests and elders who really dismiss him and mock him. He leaves that encounter and he goes and he hangs himself in one account. In another account, it seems like he might have jumped off a cliff or maybe he was thrown off a cliff after he had hung himself. We don't really know. But the point is, something in that moment caused him to feel like this was the only answer. And I know that in John's text, it says that Satan had entered into him. Which, if you think about it, you know, John is trying to make sense of this almost a century after it happened, 60, 70 years or so. He's trying to give an explanation for how Judas could have done such a horrible thing. It's a little dangerous theologically to say that Satan enters into somebody, particularly in this moment of betrayal because it takes away real human agency and choice. Judas has to be accountable for his real actions and their effect in the world. But also because clearly, if Satan had entered into him at the moment of betrayal, he was gone pretty quickly because something caused Judas to say, wait, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, here is the silver back. We don't know what Judas was feeling, but I wonder if he was replaying 
that comment from Jesus in his head that it would have been better if he had never been born? I'll have a footnote in my sermon about all the ways you can understand what that statement means. But honestly, it doesn't matter how scholars have debated it in all these years since. If Judas heard Jesus say that, how do we think it made him feel in that moment? And this is one of the great tragedies and heartbreaks of suicide, isn't it? That when a loved one dies in this way, there is so much mystery. We just want to know why. And we go back in our heads and we replay all the comments we said, all the things we could have done, should have done, didn't do, did do. We wonder if we could have done something differently. But the truth is, when someone is in that place, they are not in their full right mind of even being able to hear the fullness of what we would have said to them in that moment. This is not to say we should not intervene when someone is suicidal or depressed. It's very important to speak honestly and forthrightly with someone experiencing depression who you might think could be suicidal. To just ask them if they have thoughts of suicide, if they have a plan for their own death. Some people worry that by suggesting that, that you might be the one that brings up the idea of suicide to them and cause it to happen, but the opposite is true. When you bring up that question to them, it's validating for the depth of pain that person is feeling. Perhaps they feel seen and not ashamed for the thoughts they've been hiding. Someone is taking their pain seriously. And the truth is, asking a question about suicide will not make a non-suicidal person all of a sudden want to die in that way. Yet asking a question about suicide to someone who is suicidal might save their life because it gives an opportunity for intervention and connection. All of this is to say, we don't know why Judas died the way he did, except to know that he was in pain when he died. And his death should not define his life. And nor should this one action, even for as much pain and hurt that it caused Jesus, define his life either. This is why I have a deep tenderness toward Judas. He's given this label that he has to bear forever. It's really dehumanizing. Can you imagine being known in your life for your worst moment? <laughs> for a mistake that you made? For a time when you weren't thinking clearly, when your humanity prevailed? To maybe have a funeral and just say, well, God rest so-and-so's soul, they were a betrayer. This is not how God sees us or remembers us, my friends. We live with labels all the time. We label ourselves. <laughs> labels can be damaging, they can be helpful, but in the end, they're always confining. They always put us in a box. Just ask any kid who started school this week. They probably already have a feeling as to whether they are popular or unpopular a nerd or an athlete, if they're the bully or the one being bullied, if they're stupid or smart, the teacher's pet or the troublemaker. Kids pick up on these things really quickly, and they may not be using those exact words, but they know what they mean. They get put in a box, and we do the same thing as adults. I invite us today to think of this label that's given to Judas and to shake it off of him, but also ourselves. God does not see us for the worst things we have done in our life. That is not how we are known to God or how we are to be known to the world. Max Lucado writes about this in his children's book, You Are Special. Do you know this story? It's about a bunch of wooden people. They're called the Wimmicks. 
and they scurry around in their world and they do what they always do. They stick gold stars on the people who they think are pretty and talented and who are doing good things and they stick ugly gray dots on people who mess up or make mistakes. But the festival is coming, which is really important because there's gonna be awards given out. There's the very envied award of the most stars achieved and the dreaded most dots award. And there's this little guy named Punchinello who is a shoo-in for the most dots award. He's always doing things that are wrong in the sight of others. But one day he sees this other little girl who has no stickers. And he says to her, what's up with that? And she said, well, the stickers don't stick. And she explains to Punchinello that that's because she goes to visit Eli, her maker, and says, you need to go see him too. So Punchinello goes to see Eli, his maker, and he learns about the secret of the stickers. He apologizes for having so many on this amazing craftsmanship of his maker, saying, I'm sorry, I'm so ugly with all these great dots. And, and he says, oh, I don't, even, I don't even see those. You don't have to defend yourself to me. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think about you. And Punchinello says, you don't? He says, no, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars and dots? They're Wemmicks just like you. All that matters is what I think. And Eli looks at Punchinello and says, all that matters is that you are mine and you matter to me. And then he says, every day I've been hoping that you would come. And Punchinello says, well, I came because I met somebody who had no gray dots and no stars either. I know, Eli said, she told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her, he asked. Eli replied, because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. I think it's long past time that we ask why we've put such a lasting gray dot on Judas that we won't let fall off and in turn ask ourselves the same question about one another. I don't know if you caught it, but the good news is embedded in our text today. It is right after this moment where Judas acknowledges that he is the one who is the betrayer that we read while they were eating Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and after blessing it, he poured it out, he shared it with them and said, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. You are forgiven my friends, and so is Judas. Nothing can change that. I wonder what would happen if we remembered Judas not just as the one who betrayed, but as the one who repented, the one who went back and said he was sorry, the one who returned the silver. I'm not really sure much in his life would have changed, but I think our lives would have been very different. Because instead of seeing an example of a disciple who sinned and was sworn off forever as being bad, we would have seen a powerful example of forgiveness in Scripture, where the one who did harm asked for forgiveness from others, and that that forgiveness actually changed their actions and the future. It's very easy to demonize or categorize others for their behavior rather than centering their belovedness. May we be ones who see the belovedness of all, including ourselves. You are faithful and you are flawed and you are forgiven. Amen.